Well, good morning once again. Thank you for tuning in and coming to hear the sixth lesson in this Lenten season. Today's lesson is about missing the mark. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Father Almighty God, creator of this world, how we praise you. Father, we confess that there are times, more times than we would like to admit, that we, that we miss the mark. We thank you, God, for the many times that you give us second chances. As we examine today, those chances that were again given to the disciples. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us and the ways that you take care of us. Now, Father, we pray that you show us where we have failed you and forgive us for that failure and help us to grow Father, we look around us and see a world that is full of horrors. And we pray for our world, just as we pray for our church, our community, our individual selves. We see a world full of hate, and we ask you, God, to drive it out. We thank you, Lord, for this, for this day. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. Well, the title of today's lesson is Off Target. And as I said earlier, this is the sixth lesson of seven that we have, when we have spent a good bit of time in Mark. And we have actually gone through every event. Let's look now, before we read our, our scripture for today, Let's see what's happened since the last time we were together in the gospel. So how did the gospel, how did it end last week? With the, with the message to be alert and stay awake. We'll see that again today. What transpired in, in chapter <clears throat> 14 in the first 27 verses was that the leaders plotted to kill Jesus. Then we have the story of the woman with the expensive perfume who anointed Jesus. And Jesus goes to the chief priest and strikes a deal. Preparation was made for the Passover meal. Evening came, and there was betrayal at the meal. While our scripture is not all about that today, we also had the Lord's first supper, the first Lord's supper. And then we sang hymns, and we go to the Mount of Olives. Folks, I don't want you to be confused about Gethsemane, and the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane in Hebrew means oil press. And it's very logical that there would be an oil press at the Mount of Olives. So it was probably at the foot of the, of the mount and that the olive trees were above it. <clears throat> Listen to what Jesus had to say as we read Mark 14, verses 27 through 42. Jesus said to them, You will all falter in your faithfulness to me. It is written, I will hit the shepherd and the sheep will go off in all directions. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if everyone else stumbles, I won't. But Jesus said to him, I assure you on this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. 
But Peter insisted, If I must die alongside you, I won't deny you. And they all said the same thing. Jesus and his disciples came to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus said to them, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. He began to feel despair and was anxious. He said to them, I am very sad. It is as if I am dying. Stay here and keep alert. Then he went a short distance further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if possible, he might be spared the time of suffering. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you stay alert for one hour? Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. Again, he left them and prayed, repeating the same words. And again, when he came back, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know how to respond to him. He came a third time and said to them, Will you sleep and rest all night? That's enough. The time has come for the human one to be betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, here comes my betrayer. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And thanks be to God. What a heartbreaking story is found in these words. We see that Jesus just flats out, just speaks right up and tells them, you're going to falter in your faithfulness. And yet, look what he tells them after that. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. He didn't say, I'll hold it against you the rest of your life. He didn't say, one, do me once and, and, and I'm turn away from you. <clears throat> he instead went to Ezekiel. And where it's quoted that I will hit the shepherd and the sheep will go off in all directions. The sheep will scatter. Peter, in his ever confident voice, says, if everyone else stumbles, I won't. Because we know what comes. Isn't that heartbreaking to us when we look at Peter? We hear the words that Peter, if I must die alone, along with you, I won't deny you. They, this conversation took place between the meeting room where they, where they enjoyed the Passover meal and the garden. This was as they walked along. This conversation took place. And so when they got to the went to the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said to them, stay here, I'm going to pray. Then he called the three that were closest to him, Peter, James, and John, and called them with him. What did they want him? What did he want them to do? Simply to be there to comfort him. Do we often call on our friends when we need comfort? Absolutely. And then we see the human side of Jesus. As he prayed to the Father, he begged God, Abba, that's a, a, a word that would be like Papa or Daddy, to take this from him if it was at all possible. That was the human side of him. And what was it he didn't want to go through? He didn't want to go through that time of suffering. Now, folks, we know what that time of suffering entailed because we have the ability to look back at the Scripture. But he knew. He also knew. And he 
the human side of him wanted not to have to go through with that if there was any other way. But the godly side of him said, not my will, but thine be done. Wow. Wow. So when he aimed at the mark of doing God's will, he hit the mark right square in the middle of the target. His friends, however, were asleep. They couldn't stay with him and comfort him during his time of need. Have your friends ever let you down? I'm sure at some point some friend has not lived up to what you expected them to be. But he kept praying three times for three hours, an hour each time he prayed and went to, came back each time, and finally the time was there. And that's where our scripture ends today. Get up. Look here. Here comes my betrayer. But if the truth is told, weren't they all betrayers? Did they all miss the mark? Yes. So we turn our, our thoughts to our lesson today, and it's we realize that today's Palm Sunday and it's Holy Week, and we have we have Begin, Palm Sunday began with a promising start, the triumphant entry into, into Jerusalem, but the week didn't turn out too good. A lot of, <clears throat> a lot of times we, we think about our lives and how we have missed the mark. And we think about those that are around us that maybe have missed the mark. And we looked in the lesson today, if you looked at the student book, it told a very humorous story about eating, about looking at eating establishments in New Orleans. And the lucky dog, and if you spent much time down in that part of New Orleans, you, you will have seen a lucky dog vendor come through with a, with a hot dog, selling hot dogs. But the Interesting thing is, is there a very unlikely crew to be managing a business? They're unsettled Vietnam veterans, carnival workers, seamen. They just down and out people. And yet somehow they manage through the lucky dogs to be able to get back on their feet. And so there have been all kind of stories about them leaving at the end of a shift with the profit, with the proceeds and getting on a bus, uh, leaving town. But there's also those that have worked for lucky dog for years and years and got themselves out of poverty that way. So, there's all kinds of folks. In the teacher's edition, uh, that writer <clears throat> talks about hitting the mark and having giving a speech to a group of well-heeled businessmen that uh, that seemed to to need uh, a little little enlightenment and a little more lighthearted uh, approach to her message. So let's read what some of so she drew from some resumes and she shared this with the crowd she was speaking to. This is lifted straight from some resumes. Wholly responsible for two failed financial institutions. Failed the bar exam with relatively high grades. <laughs> it's best for my employers that I not work with people. 
I have an excellent track record, although I'm not a horse. Instrumental in running the entire operation for a Midwest chain store. Please don't construe my 14 jobs as job hopping. I never quit a job. The company made me a, sca a scapegoat, just like my three previous employers. Of course, the people at the luncheon laughed, and they had faced and looked at these kind of resumes before. The Twelve Disciples were so much like that. Fisherman, tax collector, warrior. They, they just never fully understand. But God was so generous. Jesus was so generous and consistently forgiving them and giving them second chances. <clears throat> there is a second chance that is described in Luke. And it is this parable of, about a a owner of a fig tree and the gardener that tended to it and for three years it didn't bear figs and the owner of the fig tree said cut it down but the gardener persisted and asked him to give him one more year that he would dig around it and fertilize it and perhaps it would grow figs that was the fig tree's second chance Folks, how many times does God give us a second chance? Over and over and over. We confess where we fail him and we start again. That's our lesson of today. And we know we have kind of gone through where we, uh, what's happened between then and now about our lesson. Peter just was bound and determined that he wasn't going to, to fail Jesus. At that moment, his spirit was eager, but his flesh was weak when the time came. Wow. They, if we could look back over the last weeks, we could, we could realize time and time again, the disciples didn't understand Three times on the way to Jerusalem, he told them what was going to happen. And three times, they refused to believe it or accept it. Sometimes, we ourselves are full of doubt. We, we want to control our own future, and that's what they wanted to do. Some people feel failure, fear failure. Other people fear success. Too often, we fear things that we ought not to fear. So we see that, uh, would you say that the disciples were lying to themselves or to Jesus? All of the, Rudyard Kipling says, of all liars in the world, Sometimes the worst are our own fears. Either way, fearing or lying, the disciples were moving toward their lowest point. And we know what happens after that. Let's ask ourselves some of the questions that are in the student book and in the teacher's guide. When do you recall denying Christ? How have you experienced his forgiveness and been given a second chance? Wow. How have you missed the mark in your discipleship journey, particularly in the area of of your prayer life.
What lessons can we learn from Jesus' motley crew of disciples about our faith journey? Wow. Those are questions that cause us reflection, cause us to think about where we are in our relationship. Let's look at some other questions. Where in our focal passage did Peter or other disciples resist Jesus and his words? What actions held back their absolute allegiance? In what ways did the disciples' actions or lack of actions miss the mark? Only here. When do you recall denying Christ? How have you experienced his forgiveness and been given a second chance? <clears throat> what did the disciples do with their second chances? We know they spent their lives in laying the foundation for the church and beginning the process of converting and establishing and moving forward. What, how would the church have moved forward without them? So the question comes to us, uh, what are we going to do with our second chance? Lent is supposed to be a time of reflection and self-examination. And yet here we are on Palm Sunday. I hope by now we've reflected some and we have identified some areas that we need that we need to improve. I certainly have taken a bigger part in a bigger time, more time in self-examination in my life this time, this length, maybe more than any I can recall recently. And I am committed to that growth. I hope you are too. How does this particular season of the church year help us faithfully embrace the second chances God gives us? I could tell you about the second chance I was, I was given some 14 years ago when I had open heart surgery and didn't know whether I was going to even make it through the surgery or not and, and um, how coming out of that surgery and the recovery time, I cherished every minute here on this earth and tried to make the most of them. And I have really tried to improve year by year in my, in my relationship with God and my relationship with fellow, my fellow man. What do we need to let go of in order to receive the gift of new opportunities? Wow. Do you, can you recall when someone gave you a second chance? Maybe you messed something up and they just overlooked it. And tell, told you, patted you on the back and said, you'll do better next time. What is the relationship between forgiveness and second chances? What lessons can we learn from Jesus' motley crew of disciples about our own faith journey? We always have time. Next week's lesson is the last one in this quarter's exploration of Mark. I have really enjoyed it, by the way. The text for the next week's lesson is from Mark 16, 1 through 8. If you've not read, read it. Read from where we are today until the end of that, verse 8. Let's now go to the Lord in prayer.
Almighty God on this day. Your son Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem and has proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and branches along his way. Let those branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads us to eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in, for, wel for welcoming me into your home. If there's any way that we here at the First United Methodist Church in Brookhaven, Mississippi can assist you, please feel free to contact us. Thank you again.